She just felt guilty and broken. There was no diagnosis someone could give her husband that would help give him some guidance, give him something, when he just wanted to help. Just wanted to understand why she was always curled up on the top of the covers of her bed as the afternoon sun came in hot through the window. They didn't call it a nervous breakdown then, or a time-limited episode of mental duress, or acute adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and depressed mood. They just knew something had to change. And her doctor suggested she leave Mexico. There was someone in San Francisco who might help her. The move broke up her marriage, though not at first. But her husband didn't speak English, and couldn't find work and in the clear light, the kind you get up there when the mist burns off as the day goes on. What were they doing together anyway? And so Inez was on her own in the East Bay, in the care of a Dr. Philip Brown. This was a time when psychology was new and psychologists were just fumbling around at best. At worst, they were barbaric. But I can tell you with no small sense of relief that that wasn't Inez's story. Her doctor was just improvising, essentially, Mm -hmm. like the rest of them at the time. But he was guided by kindness, and curiosity, and empathy, and all those things one would want their doctor to be. He worked with Inez for years, helped her through the disillusion of her second marriage, helped her find some balance. And he did what anyone, a therapist, a friend, an inspirational Facebook meme, might do now. He told her to get out and meet people. Join a club. Take a class. She was 50. Her life hadn't been happy. But it didn't have to stay that way. She started hiking in the Redwoods with the Sierra Club. Made some friends. She'd go to Golden Gate Park and bring a picnic and a book. Sit out in the breeze for hours. She remembered how much she loved nature. She joined this group to save the sequoias. There were meetings. She'd see people at the meetings, and that was nice. She took the trolley up Telegraph to Berkeley one day to see if she could audit some classes, and someone at the registrar's office told her that they had a program for older students. She enrolled at 51, wanting to study the natural world, paleontology, animal sciences, things like that. And she loved plants, so she enrolled in a seminar about collecting and cataloging botanical specimens. And this is it. This is the dramatic moment. The turning point in the story here at 5 minutes and 38 seconds. The part at the cliff is still coming, but we're pausing here because this is the moment that matters. And this is all you're going to get in terms of drama. Just a 51-year-old lady signing up for a class that will teach her how to press flowers and how to put the glue on the little strips of fabric so you can stick the plants to the white paper. Just a middle-aged person whose life had been little but long, marked by years of the kind of sadness and disappointments and loneliness and failed and misguided relationships that cling like burrs. At some point you stop bothering to pick them off. And then this person at 51 years old finds something she truly loves. And this is the thing. And it is always the thing. She does it. Inez Mexia, four years later at 55, then expert in spotting and identifying, cutting, drying, and cataloging botanical samples for academic study, embarked on a solo expedition to the foothills of the Sierra Madre Mountains, east of Mazatlan, Mexico. She hired a guide. She spoke fluent Spanish. Two failed marriages to Mexican men had given her that, at least. And she hiked and canoed and rode on horseback. She slept in tents, slept in the open air under the stars. And she'd stopped to cut flowers, reach to clip leaves from high branches, collect the seed pods of shade trees that would snow in the desert, catch the air and soar and dip and rise on some unseen current and disappear. She'd dry them and press them, describe where they were found and label them, and send them off, one set to Berkeley, one to Harvard, one to the herbarium at the Royal Botanical Gardens in London, and other places. She had made deals before she left. They'd pay her 20 cents per specimen. And one day she was in the mountains and she spotted a plant she'd never seen before. Maybe something wholly new, something yet unclassified, growing out from a crack at the edge of a cliff, and she crawled toward it out over the valley and reached and fell, as you know already. But there were plants below her that broke her fall and saved her, as seems appropriate. 
And she broke some ribs and hurt her hand, and she had to go back home early, and that was the extent of it. She had collected fewer plants than she had hoped. But she had hiked the Sierra Madre Mountains at 55. And she had loved it. She had loved it. And so she returned, and returned again, to Mexico, barefoot in the reeds and salt marshes in Esquinapa de Higaldo, in the back of a dugout canoe on a night lit only by fireflies blinking on the banks of the Grijalva, to Panama through the canal, to Ecuador and Peru and Brazil up the Amazon, to Alaska, to the Andes, to Tierra del Fuego, and then home to Berkeley, when she was 68 and losing weight. And her friends, there were so many of them, from the university, from the Sierra Club, were there for her as she died, from lung cancer in the July of 1938. She'd been diagnosed just a month before. In the 18 years of her life after she took that class, and after she'd found that thing at 55 that filled her, and then went and did that thing, she collected more than 150,000 specimens. She found over 500 new species and one new genus of flowering asters, now called Mexianthus mexicanus, named after her and after the place she once left behind when her life fell apart and then returned to again and again. And those plants are still with us, in drawers mostly, in herbariums, old museums, the basements of botanical societies, dried and preserved, labeled and meticulously cataloged, glued just so to white pages now yellowed with age, as she had learned to do in a classroom at the age of 52. Each one of them, each flower she saw poke out of the dirt and said that one, each leaf she had stood on tiptoes to take, each blade of grass she had pulled from the hillside with her fingertips, is a moment in her life, and a choice she made. 